those who are before us and then we'll dive into our conversation and discussion. Um, please uh, do use the Q&A. Um, if you're on YouTube, you can also feel free to use the chat function there to drop your questions or comments. Um, you can also um, use, I believe, the chat to communicate at least with the hosts and panelists if you want to make a make a comment, although there's no guarantee that we'll <laughs> be able to keep up with all of that. Um, so your best option is the Q&A. Um, so, so thank you to the School of Social Transformation and particularly uh, Jeannie Colquette and Marjani Hawkins for making this possible. Your labor is, is so critical um, in, in making this possible. Um, I'd also like to thank the Institute for Humanities Research for sponsorship. Um, and for really bringing us together for this conversation. I wanna um, introduce Catherine and, and Tina and we'll go in, um, in order of Catherine, myself, JT Roan, and then uh, Professor Tina Camp. So Catherine Youssef is professor of inhuman geography in the School of Geography at Queen Mary University of London. Her research examines materialities of the inhuman in the context of environmental change, race and subjectivity, most recently, she is author of the phenomenal A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None on University of Minnesota. She's a SI on geosocial formations and the Anthropocene in theory, culture, and society, um, uh, epical aesthetics, the mind as paradigm, white utopia, black inferno, and efflux, and the inhumanities in the annals of American geographers. Her forthcoming book, Geologic Life, Inhuman Intimacies and the Geophysics of Race, addresses the histories of geology and the gravities of race. Um, and you can uh, follow Catherine for more information about her work. Um, I'm JT Roan. Um, I'm assistant professor here of African and African American Studies in the School of Social Transformation um, at ASU. And uh, of course, uh, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Tina Camp, who's ONF Walker Professor of Humanities and Modern Culture and Media. Camp is a Black feminist theorist of visual culture, culture and contemporary art, one of the founding researchers in Black European studies. Her early work theorized gender, racial, and diasporic formation in Black communities in Europe, focusing on the role of vernacular photography in processes of historical interpretation. She's the author of three books, Other Germans, Black Germans on the Politics of Race, Gender and Memory in the Third Reich, uh, Image Matters, Archive, Memory, I mean, Image Matters, Archive, Photography in the African Diaspora in Europe, and Listening to Images. Her forthcoming book, A Black Gaze, will be published by MIT in fall 2021. And I think that's already here. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Congratulations, Tina. She's held faculty positions at the Technical University of Berlin, University of California, Santa Cruz, Duke, and Barnard College. She currently serves as a research associate at the Visual Identities in Art and Design Research Center at the University of Johannesburg. At the Koga Institute, she leads the Black Vis Visualities Initiative. Um, and it's great to be in conversation with you again, Tina, after <laughs> some time. So I'm going to turn it over to Catherine. Each of us will um, speak for a few moments and then uh, around this topic of insurgent geophysics, black gravities, and then we'll um, and then we'll reconvene for a conversation with you all. Thank you. So Catherine. Thanks so much, uh, JT, and thank you to ASU and particularly to Ron who organized uh, my visit last year um, that this was part of. Um, it's such a um, profoundly uh, creative space to have these interdisciplinary conversations and um, maybe we can get back uh, some, in some of the questions to the importance of um, interdisciplinary conversations. Um, so I'm just gonna say a few kind of opening remarks about gravity and maybe to just say how I kind of came to think about gravity. Um, so a bit of the backstory that might kind of uh, set us up for some of the questions that might emerge around um, gravity. So I very much kind of began, began kind of thinking about gravity in the context of thinking about geology and specifically white geology and a kind of how to understand a kind of material grounding of race. Um, so 
this work is kind of very historically uh, located in kind of how geology emerges in colonialism and how this sets up a very particular sort of and distinct relation between blackness and the mind. And to see this as a kind of geophysical location, as well as a kind of psychic um, condition of extraction. So there's kind of very obvious forms of racial undergrounding that are still kind of very much present in the blackness, anti-blackness of the day. Um, but there's also these kind of really uh, intimate forms of mining, which are, also, which are partly constituted by extraction, but also kind of forms of resistance that I think kind of um, Tina's work uh, and JT's work particularly kind of address as a kind of active fashioning of history and memory and flesh that are kind of co-constituted with white surfaces and surfacing and this kind of geophysics of whiteness, um, but are also kind of working to mine in a very different kind of uh, modality. So I became interested in this question or rather kind of like um, to try and understand what allowed whiteness to levitate as a force and not just a kind of metaphysical force, but a geophysical force that had a historical geography and how we might kind of understand this within a constitution of, uh, understand, of earth politics. Um, so like my work was broadly and has been for a long time around kind of these dynamics of geologic life um, the question that emerged for me is around this kind of splitting of the bios and the geos and what this kind of bifurcation of life into two distinct geographical zones does. Um, and the way in which I've been thinking about it is in the constitution of the plateau of, or the kind of overseer of white geology, the surveyor, um, the plantation owner, the miner, etc., and the kind of creation of rifts. So this idea of a kind of white geology that has a perspectivism of the plateau and these kind of rifts, which are the racial, racialized undergrounds and kind of the constituted figures of those. Um, so white geology renders this kind of gravity or a sort of form of geopools that magnetize um, both to certain metals and minerals, but also to um, constitute certain bodies in how they kind of meet the earth uh, and the gravity that pulls them down um, towards, especially towards the violence of the earth. Um, so if we think about colonialism, we can think about it as a process of breaking grounds, but it also established these kind of racialized populations as repeatedly located within broken grounds. And then to think about the sort of sensibility that is kind of becomes possible or made within that, within those kind of broken grounds. So for me, the kind of secret question that emerges out of this is what allows whiteness to float? Um, and what are the kind of consequences of this floating? Um, and how is this underpinned? And how does it reproduce a particular metaphysics of the earth? And what, how does this get kind of um, carried forward in terms of how we understand the kind of politics of the earth now in the constitution of sort of the Anthropocene? So this is a very particular kind of gravity of whiteness that is allowed to and fashions the narratives of time and space. So it imposes these kind of anti-black gravities. So weathers in Christina Sharp's term. But what I was particularly sort of interested in and trying to figure out is how this gravity was geomorphic. So how it materially manifests as a power geometry. Uh, in that's kind of rooted through accounts of infrastructures of materialities, but also these kind of uh, effectual infrastructures, uh, kind of aesthetics of sense. So there's this kind of geophysics of sense that emerge out of the kind of material uh, kind of uh, infrastructures of extraction and of kind of forms of extraction and in the ways in which these migrate across social spaces. Um, so one of the kind of questions there is kind of around gravity understood as a kind of, as a form of defamation that lands on subjects in particular kinds of ways. Um, but also to think about gravity as this historical set of conditions that create the conditions of falling, as well as the kind of counter gravities of falling upwards in resistance, as we might think about it and how to hold the possibility of this falling upwards 
Um, and what this requires in terms of receptive atmospheres of holding, so a tender and a question of holding to account. So um, what I was trying to do in my work is really kind of think about how to hold these disciplines that I'm located in to account in within this kind of process of kind of a falling upwards um, or the precarity of life and kind of colonial afterlives. Um, so that's kind of one sort of track through gravity. Another is really to think about the flesh of geology. Uh, and that's very much a kind of riff of uh, Orton Spiller's um, uh, framing of flesh within the context uh, of enslavement. Um, but to think about re-subject fine geology uh, through these kind of architectures of sense uh, means understanding this kind of inhuman story as a subjective and subjugating uh, story within these sort of geophysics of race, these histories of race. Um, but also to see this other relation between the inhuman and inhumane as a kind of structural or stratigraphic imposition. Um, and one that is built in the praxis of geology and its grammars of extraction. So this kind of uh, leads us to thinking about if, if decolonization is a kind of a process of taking apart, how do you begin to take apart gravity? How do you begin to kind of act within and on these grammars of geology that render subjects as inhuman matter, as kind of uh, sites of extraction, but also sites of falling? Um, so kind of one mode of white geology might be the sort of geocoding of bodies, but the other is the organization of the earth through a racialized geophysics. Um, and this also means that earth archives are the flesh of geology. So earth archives are kind of constituted through a missing earth or a black earth. And we often, you know, it's like we see that black earth in kind of environmental policy and so on as always a negative inscription. Um, but maybe part of the kind of part of the work is to actually really understand how those earth archives, uh, and I think kind of and particularly your work on black ecologies, um, JT has been doing is, is exist in all these other places. So in all these other kind of archives of uh, geology. So if race travels in our, our archives as the flesh of geology, it's also establishing itself in lots of other kind of uh, spaces. Um, so this also means that black and subjects have an intimacy with the earth that is unknown to the structural position of whiteness. Um, so it's also kind of the, to think about this sort of possibility of a kind of, you know, of a sort of displaced uh, being in the rift, but also the kind of potentialities of what that cosmo being kind of organized itself um, through and as. Um, so I guess one of the things that we might sort of think about uh, collectively and which I would like to think about J with, with JT and Tina is really how kind of um, we think about this geophysics in uh, as a kind of both a historical process of fashioning of earth and the proximity um, of personhood and bodies um, and also in the pl political present. Um, and how and what does this mean to take the pressure off? So what are the kind of insurgent acts and the insurgent grammars that allow the possibility to make gravity with other kind of handholds on the air? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, always so insightful, Catherine. It's great to be in conversation with you again. And I wanna say, um, yes, I did not mean to neglect Ron Broglio's uh, important, significant contributions in bringing us together a couple of times now. So I, I wanna thank Ron. Um, I am gonna switch into my remarks and then uh, we'll go over to Tina. So, um, and I, I'm really interested in the kind of um, resonance here as I imagined it would be between um, what I have to say and what you've already started us with and what Tina will undoubtedly uh, bring forward. Um, so gravity, anti-Blackness, and the social incineration of Philadelphia. Um, gravity is a critical component shaping the contours of fire. 
As Robert A. Altenkert discusses in an interview with Scientific American regarding experiments with how alternative gravitational fields affect combustion on Earth, gravity tends to anchor fire, reinforcing its intensity as hot gases move upward, sucking oxygen toward the lower portion of, of the flames. The microclimate of the fire, oriented vertically by gravity, creates a suction that amplifies the temperatures of the material serving as the fire's primary source of fuel and allowing it to spread. Fire is intensified by gravity uh, such that while fires are sometimes easier to start under similar conditions of oxygenation with less gravitational force, they tend to dissipate rather than further intensify outside a, a, a dense gravitational field similar to Earth's. With this in mind, I want to draw on work about gravity, the gravity of anti-Blackness and the ways that it oriented and enhanced social combustion in the urban re-territorialization of the late 20th century U.S. Given the current planetary scale of social combustion, euphemized under the rubrics of climate change or the Anthropocene, this is an important Black or Black story for our present. Um, this work uh, draws from my second manuscript, which might be confusing to Professor Camp since <laughs> you were on my committee and this was originally part of my first project. Uh, but from my second manuscript titled uh, Fire, Philadelphia, in a riff on the title of John Edgar Wyman's 1990 novel, I situate the 1985 police bombing, a move within the wider matrix of infrastructural volatility political vengeance and resistance that followed the fragmentation of the shared infrastructures of living, especially in Philly after the 1981 uh, fiscal crisis started um, in the wake of federal retrenchment. Fire serves as a powerful metaphor for examining the city's political ecology in this era. Its intangibility, yet intense material effect, amplified by the gravity of anti-Blackness, represents the uneven ways that the combustion of deindustrialization, state retrenchment, and political vitriol against vulnerable groups, including the de-housed, drug users, sex workers, and Black and Puerto Rican communities broadly, created distal conditions, shaping more proximate cases of death through house and industrial fires, intravenous use, uh, drug use, overdoses, the unchecked HIV epidemic, and the proliferation of automatic weapons. Together, these conditions created a destructive syndemic wherein fire, displacement, infectious disease, exposure to toxicity, violent political rhetoric, and physical violence amplify one another to the point of social combustion. While the bomb in a move marked an exceptional case of state murder, the deaths are understood best on a continuum of quotidian antagonisms and weaponizations of city services against vulnerable groups and dissidents alike. Alongside in this wider project, this historical sort of epidemiology, I also analyzed the work of Black harm reductionists who counteracted these conditions as well as the radical indifference and popular vengeance enacted by first responders, city officials, politicians, mainstream journalists, and, and wider majoritarian publics. Um, and in this manuscript, the what that this remark that these remarks draw from. Black harm reduction politics encompasses those engaging uh, directly in needle exchange and condom distribution efforts in response to HIV, but also to a cadre of critical neighborhood journalists, housing organizers, hip hop artists, filmmakers, religious leaders, and ordinary residents who bore witness to and attempted to disrupt the social, this, these forms of social incineration. Significantly Black harm reductionists help articulate no novel formulations of political constituency among those condemned to widening archipelagos of suffering. I um, mean, I wanna um, note that I'm drawing here heavily on Antoine Johnson, who's um, really doing some cutting edge work around black harm reduction in the Bay Area. Um, this uh, derisive descriptions of insurgent black social existence, ranging from so-called prostitutes to groups like MOVE as literal insurgents, help citizens, in scare quotes, uh, come to terms with the dizzying forces and uneven geographies that resulted from the processes of social incineration. Scrutiny of the bodies and behaviors of vulnerable people amplified the role of individual choice over structural analysis, displacing anxiety about economic and political dislocations accompanying the transformation of urban political economy 
to the scale of individual and communal behavior and leading ultimately to simplistic solutions identified with the removal of hyper visible subjects through incarceration and death in the face of, of um, economic vulnerability and retrenchment. As I've written about in a recent essay for a special issue of Signs on Rage, Spitting Back at Law and Order, Donetta Hills or Yasantawa Ama's case exposes the contours of this transformation, the proportions uh, of, wit of monstrosity reached in court, um, acting to contain her statuses as dehoused, drug using, and on welfare, along with the prosecutor's elemental bestialization of her physical and mental features, uh, she served as a scapegoat for mass vulnerability, exposure, dislocation, and death, only resolvable through the state's embrace of what Mumia Abu-Jamal and earlier Camus understood as the ultimate symbolic vengeance in condemnation through capital punishment. I want to hear talk around the, uh, from the remainder of my time around the bomb and a move um, to think about the gravity of anti-Blackness and its intensification of social incineration in the deindustrialized, falsely austere urbanism of the late 20th century. Critically, various city departments, officials, and politicians drove conflict with MOVE and the deaths following the bombing. Um, and this, this wasn't just limited to police. Uh, critically, as folks have um, recognized since at least the MOVE Commission, and if you were paying attention to MOVE members earlier than that, uh, the explosive that detonated on, um, after the explosive detonated on May 13th, 1985, the PPD and the city's fire department conspired in an action for an hour before attempting to put out the flames. Um, police further weaponized the fire by shooting at MOVE members as they attempted to escape the heat and smoke. Although Ramona and one child, Birdie Africa, survived the catastrophic fire, in total 11 MOVE members, including five children, as well as their, their dogs, perished. Um, more than 250 others in a Cobbs Creek neighborhood were displaced when the fire destroyed 50 neighboring um, row houses. Uh, the connection between police aggression and the fire department's neglect was not an aberration either. As the short-lived community newspaper, the North Philly Free Press, um, which I consider along with needle exchange and other efforts as part of a robust black harm reduction effort, as they documented, poor black residents regularly succumbed to fires in the 1980s. In 1983, the Free Press uh, was alone among the city's papers who covered the death of Janice Shipman Baker, a black woman who died after her, her home burn on March 20th, 1984. The paper covered a fire that began on Peach Street in West Philly. Before it was contained, the blaze spread to two adjoining houses, killing six black young people. Um, so what I'm getting at here is that MOVE is in that context, outside of the kind of direct antagonism of the state through a bombing, the profile of deaths is not, is not dramatically remarkable. Like MOVE members who uh, were tacitly held responsible for their own deaths, um, no officials were indicted or otherwise held responsible for the MOVE bombing. Black fire victims in general were often implicated for their own deaths. Uh, fire officials use insinuation to hide in plain sight the conditions produced by the gravity of anti-Blackness and the disintegration of the city's housing stock through industrialization and neglect on the part of absentee landlords. Such economic abandonment was made even more deadly by the radical indifference of first responders and city officials. For example, in 1984, Jacqueline Wheeler and the child in her care, eight-year-old George Gaskins, sat watching television in the front room of their apartment. After a few minutes, um, when George went to the back, Wheeler noticed the front of the apartment, or after, um, after uh, Wheeler went to the back, uh, George, who sat watching television in the, in the front room of the apartment, uh, Wheeler, Wheeler noticed from the, the front a dense, uh, thickening, thickening smoke. Although she attempted to rescue Gaskins, um, the boy died. The, doc the documentation of the incident in the fire detectives reports shows officials explicit contempt and disregard for vulnerable black people, including youth in this context. Rather than condemning the apartment owner for faulty electrical wires, and that's a quote, detectives suggested that Gaskins, quote, may have been playing with the exposed wiring, ca causing his own untimely demise. Uh, 
Detectives cast aspersion on the boy's actions and those of his caretaker while ignoring the responsibility of the landlord in the fatality. Um, it, so in short, the, the violence against Mu was part of a pattern of government contempt for working class black life um, and, the, and willful neglect to provide even basic city services. Um, as black gay anthologist and writer Joseph Beam acknowledged in an essay, quote, the, uh, the agents of normalcy and decency who had acted to kill the group had potentially deadly implications for all black Philadelphians. As he noted, the bombing caused him quake, quote, psychic scars um, and made him deeply afraid as a black gay man who was a writer for his life and his home. Indeed, the city's everyday contempt for black life was part of the animating force of Mu's activism in the first place. Um, and they weren't alone, um, though they are, because of the spectacular nature of their deaths, of many of the group's deaths, um, they weren't alone. The city's black communities more broadly organized against the climate of municipal indifference and violent responses to, to their suffering. On May 26, uh, 1982, for example, residents gathered at Daniel Baptist Church in North Philly um, to discuss the effects of the city's infrastructural disintegration and the deterioration and weaponization of municipal services. They were galvanized by the death of 13-year-old Darren Wilson, who many residents believe had died from first responders' indifference and the city's emphasis on law and order as much as his injury, the injuries he sustained when struck by a car. Um, as one witness testified during the community meeting, emergency dispatchers placed those seeking help for the teenager on hold repeatedly. Rather than paramedics, quote, two cars in one van, load of cops arrived first, and they all, quote, stood around for maybe 10 minutes before, quote, two cops pulled his arms and legs and threw him on a stretcher without care, like he wasn't a human, end quote. The fiery deaths of move, uh, women, men, children, and pets were sadly not exceptional. Um, and I think we could unpack this further in relation to what um, Catherine has really laid out as a compelling um, the, uh, compelling strategy for thinking about this through um, the stratification and geological. Um, critically, the city's attempt to destroy move by fire unfolded in a wider political ecology of debilitation and death, amplified by municipal antagonism, creating and intensifying the gravitational force of anti-Blackness and with it governance through social incineration. So I'm gonna turn my time um, over to Tina to continue our discussion, thank you. Um, I'm going to thank everyone again. Um, thank you, Ron. Thank you, uh, JT. Uh, thank you, Catherine. I'm happy to be in conversation. Um, and I think I'm going to continue to do the echo, uh, the echo chamber <laughs> that we started, um, because uh, I think that some of our points of reference, many of our points of reference, um, are similar. Um, and so in trying to articulate gravity, um, I guess that the, the important question for me is how did I come to write about gravity? And I write about gravity in the new book, A Black Gaze. Um, and so I come to gravity uh, by way of two points. One is in relationship to the work of black artists um, and how they are challenging us to see, feel, engage, think about the precarity of black bodies in our contemporary moment. And that gravity plays a role. Um, gravity is a concept that to me um, helps us to understand the ways in which black bodies are moving um, and the ways in which they are uh, contorting in the work of black visual artists. Um, but I came to the term as well by way of one of the reference points that um, that Catherine named, which is uh, the black feminist theorist uh, Christina Sharp um, and her articulation of anti blackness as an atmospheric condition that she calls the weather. Um, and she calls this the weather, I'm sure everyone is, is, is familiar with it, but I want to sort of bring her words into the conversation, which is the weather is the totalitarian, the totality of our environment. The weather is the total climate and that climate is anti-black. It is not the specifics of any one event or set of events, but the totality of the environments in which we struggle, the machines in which we live, what she calls the weather. 
and the weather necessitates, as a result, changeability and improvisation. It is the atmospheric condition of time and place, and it produces new ecologies. And I wanted to bring her words into that, into our discussion, because um, there's a kind of, there's a, a nuance that I think that she names that is related to the way in which we're all talking about um, uh, gravity, which is on the one hand, she's talking about anti-Blackness as uh, a climate or a weather that is all encompassing, right? So that is something that is normalized um, in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and at the same time, she makes a really important point that as a result of this, Black communities have to create new ecologies. And this really goes to um, to the work that, that JT is doing. And so that distinction to me is really important because it is not about uh, the fact that um, the weather is um, that one will necessarily always capitulate to the weather, right? Um, that she makes an analogy that is really about the lives of Black folks in the afterlife of slavery, whereby the Black subject is constituted through the negation that was the Middle Passage, but at the same time, she's also trying to say that they are not defined by it, right? So constitu constitutive of Blackness and anti-Blackness, but not definitional, right, of Black folks. And so here the question to me um, is where I get to the weather, right, <laughs> where I get to gravity, which is in thinking about the climactic structure of anti-Blackness in relationship to the weather, my question um, was, how does it circulate and what is the, the driving force behind its formations? And that's where gravity comes in, right? Because gravity is what drives weather patterns. Gravity is what drives anti-Blackness, right? And I'm thinking about that in a, in a climactic sense and in a global sense, right? Um, and so when I theorize gravity, I'm theorizing it as a force, um, a force or a pull of matter that gives it weight. Right. Um, similarly, one of the things that I'm trying to juxtapose is that if anti-blackness, that anti-blackness as gravity is my articulation of the downward force of white supremacy on the possibilities for black subjects to live unbounded lives. Um, and then analogously, if anti-blackness is gravitational, right, um, that does not, again, taking, um, taking Christina's um, distinction to heart, even if anti-Blackness is gravitational, it is not necessarily inescapable. It can and it must be navigated. It can and it must be countered by other forces. Um, and that's what I theorize as Black counter gravity and where I put counter in, per, in parentheses. And I put counter in parentheses because I'm trying to think, well, I, there was a kind of equivocation, I think, in my own theorization of Black gravity which has to do with can if we're talking about gravity as being anti-black do i want to uh, repurpose this term um, and my equivocation remains <laughs> that i do feel like there is a way in which we need to think about a counter gravitational force but that also does mean that it is it does have certain kind of gravitational um, dimensions um, and so what I theorize as uh, counter gravity, uh, black counter gravity is the black subject's capacity to defy the physics of anti blackness that has historically exerted a negating force aimed at expunging black life. Right. And in the book, I actually um, I part of one of the ways in which I'm, I'm trying to describe this is, you know, in relationship to Catherine's work um, and thinking about forms of directionality that don't have a destination. And I think it's really important to, to think about um, Catherine's conception of uh, falling up. And I want to come back to that um, because I, I that really did pique my interest. And we've had that conversation before, right? And I'd like to extend it. Um, and so when I'm when I'm talking about um, black counter gravity in the book, in the work of artists, I'm trying to describe the ways in which they enact the forces that press on or deform or resist 
um, or are resisted by black bodies who refuse to capitulate to the weather of anti-blackness and the ways in which they visualize a tactical and a creative exploitation of gravity in their own favor. Um, so what I see in, in the work of the artists that I write about is the ways in which they reclaim bodies that are often seen as disposable, Black urban youth, Black rural youth, Black elders, right, through a performance of countergravity that registers their materiality, their weight, right, um, and at the same time gestures towards something that becomes weightless, right, that can defy gravity. Um, and there I think um, I want to linger on something that occurred to me in the context of preparing for this conversation, which is that I really, I think like, like, um, like Catherine and JT, I too am thinking about gravity as a force, right, as a force that presses, presses down, contorts, hinders black bodies in time and space, right. But in starting to, to think about this conversation, I I went into a geek wormhole, which I am often prone to do, and I actually love it. Um, and I started thinking about or reading about Einstein and Einstein's um, theory of general relativity, um, which is a theory of gravity. Um, and while I cannot say that I completely grasp Einstein in any way, shape, or form, um, I think that his premise is really illuminating in our thinking about racialized bodies and the geophysics of anti-blackness. And, and there, like, again, my basic grasp of it is that Einstein's view, theory of general relativity is one that posits gravity as not necessarily being an invisible force that attracts objects to one another. It's, it's, for him, it's not that. He conceives of it instead as a curving or warping of space itself. Um, so, for example, the more massive a, an object, the more it warps space around it. And the big example there would be black holes, right? So that we only see, we only can perceive of black holes because of the way in which its gravitational forces warp the space around it. Um, and so I guess that that's the question that I want to think about together with the two of you as a sort of jumping off point to come back to some of the really fascinating points that you all raised which is what if we are thinking about um, gravity as fundamentally reshaping space, um, fundamentally, fundamentally curving it, warping it, and how then might we understand gravity to be something that is, again, not directional in the way in which Catherine wants us to understand it, um, but instead structurally reshaping um, different contours and different limitations and different possibilities. Um, so I think I'll end there and, and we can transition into a conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you, for your really um, generative uh, prompts and, and discussion. Catherine, did you want to jump in directly to, to address Tina's uh, remark or question? Oh, absolutely. I'm not sure which one to start with. <laughs> they're already kind of, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, I think um, this kind of question of sort of the warpiness of whiteness, in a sense mm -hmm. of like, you know, what is the deformation of the earth and the whiteness and coloniality has kind of left in its wake, in, you know, since 1492 or whatever, you know, which is kind of named the Anthropocene, but the much more interesting question that I think you're kind of organizing there is around kind of how do these geo forces create the very kind of possibility of like every form of kind of corporal and earthly intuition right that that mm -hmm. organize the kind of the body's learning and the discipline ways in which kind of it's possible to move and constitute space and this is um and i think this is like so the way in which i've been kind of trying to think about this is through white surfaces or what allows whiteness to surface in particular ways and kind of remain sort of um, uh, kind of keep those geoforces in place. So what is it that, so if we think about that as a geoforce, um, there's forms of sedimented geopower 
that historically organize those GEO forces. So it's not just it's not just one kind of, but it's as JT was talking about, a whole set of social combustions, right? That are kind of inflamed or these kind of tactical burnings that become part of the general condition, you know, the normative condition of living. So I've been trying to understand these through kind of things like natural resources and the kind of as a structural kind of weight of colonialism. And I guess the kind of um, the question there is that for me is that what does a certain participation with the earth kind of they offer in terms offer to in a sense to black studies um, and is already being kind of worked you know already has been worked through in lots of kind of really um, sort of uh, incredible sort of uh, ways is that if we dig through this kind of these geoforces and these kind of questions of elemental arrangements of subjectivity, what other kind of slipstreams become possible? And I think that the artist work that you've been kind of um, looking at, Tina, really kind of, you know, in, in some ways they're kind of slipstreams, but they counter, and it's almost like there's a tension here, right? There's um, and you indicate in terms of the use of counter gravity, because counter gravity is always in a site, sort of dialectical relation to stratal pressure. So if we see the kind of whiteness as a stratal pressure that creates anti black uh, gravities, the counter force is always a dialectic. So it's always locked in, in a sense, to that mm -hmm. arrangement. So what is the kind of matter fix or the sort of that allows a different kind of a different bending of those mm -hmm. gravitational forces. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, and part of that is obviously what um, both of you have talked about is kind of like, you know, sort of that resistance of the deadening of black life. But it's also kind of, it's also much more uh, sort of, yeah. I and mean, then it's, it's, it reconditions its own kind of coordinates of possibility, right? So. It is, I mean, I've been thinking about it as in terms of kind of cosmo being in the sense that it reconstitutes the kind of arrangements of gravity through the kind of cosmos in a sense, like through the earth and through the cosmos and, and offers a different understanding of subjectivity um, that is not kind of, you know, is not in that dialectic relation. So I guess kind of, and this, is, this also kind of comes back to a question I had for JT, uh, specifically, but also is in relation to um, Christina Sh Sharp's use of ecology. So ecology emerges out of like a closed system, closed loop sort of understanding of relations. And it kind of emerges in a particular kind of colonial context of the Odin brothers um, and actually kind of human subject testing in the Marshallese islands. But it, it emerges through this idea of a kind of closed organization of systems, which is also the dialectic of stratal. So what is it, how do, how do we begin to name the other movements that, that are kind of, that uh, are not then are creating their own universes in a sense? So what is the languaging of that kind of, the other form of uh, and way of being that is not in this kind of closed loop dialectical relation? Um, so that's that's something that is kind of is it's a kind of question of language, but it's also it's a question I think kind of that uh, you root Tina in your work through kind of the somatic um, possibilities of vision in a sense mm -hmm. as a kind of as a bodily possession that mm -hmm. like, that that kind of that creates different spaces, right? It sort of reorganizes the spatial dimensions and possibilities um, of kind of, uh, of that structural weight of colonialism. Mm -hmm. I want to jump in on the question. Thank you. This is so provocative and I'm here like filling my notebook as, <laughs> as things, as we continue this conversation, uh, you know, all of these really significant, not only, I don't, metaphor makes it, um, seem less substantial than the work that y'all are doing, but the kind of, um, for lack of a better word, the metaphors that are coming out are so generative. Um, and it seems like for the audience as well in our Zoom room. Um, I think um, gravity is thinking about not as a kind of directionality, um, 
I think even as I thought about it as a kind of directionality in relation to fire and the kind of intensification of anti-Black gravities in relation to shaping a, a urban landscape, um, I think it continues to shape and, and maybe the straddle pressure dialectic um, forces that Catherine was just discussing won't hold out if I don't really <laughs> fully understand them. But I wanna say that these anti-Black forces continue to shape the way that livability is articulated, the way that um, a future ecology, um, both as a closed system, as, as a kind of planetary uh, system um, is imagined, right? And that, I mean, that's directly in terms of certain kinds of infrastructures that have been in place within the last 15 or so years through real estate investment trusts in particular, right? It's not like any of those places or any of those entities went and found dead zones in a repetition of the kind of um, genocidal um, origins of, of US uh, cities, et cetera, um, they found where, uh, where life was already, right? And so I think, I think the kind of repression of those continues to provide uh, an important understanding for the ways in which uh, the fields of urban life that we could think around emerging around urban or rural life, um, and particularly again through the rubrics of livability, are warped um, and and have these um, seeming directions that away from death towards life that are that if that your provocation, Tina, I think really um, blows open. I think um, I also think that these kind of I thought about this with the first project a lot. Um, the ways, especially of a kind of black hole, or as I call it, dark agora, in that in in this context, um, the ways that these kind of deep sites of anti-black density that are originally formed through uh, the gravity of anti-blackness and this kind of directionality also forms the opacity or um, obscurity that facilitates the kinds of world making that you're um, drawing us towards, Catherine, or telling us to rename outside of this kind of closed loop ecology form formulation. And I think, so that is, that is both the reality that um, these sites are totally legible vis-a-vis -vis the state and vis-a-vis -vis livability because they're in dense zones of anti-Blackness, but that's also their possibility for something otherwise. And so um, I think I'll stop there, but um, thank you for these wonderful provocations, both of you. Um, I continue to look forward to where we'll go with this. <laughs> Well, I want to go back to um, to falling up. Oops. Yes, I'm, I thought I'm, I I was muted, but I'm not. Um, yeah, because you know one of the things that I was I was struck by, and I don't know if this is an Americanism or not, but falling up is pejorative here. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, it it doesn't have. It's I don't say that to criticize, but I wanted to say it because thinking about falling up as possibility, I found myself resisting that because he in this country falling up means that you actually get something you don't deserve, right? From something that makes it seem like you're in a, in a diminished possibility, you end up falling up um, so that you, you didn't deserve this thing, but it turned into something pos positive. So, so that was one of the things I was thinking about. But again, that when I was thinking, when I was listening to um, the idea of falling up and that lack of directionality, um, that we do get trapped in this notion of gravity. And I'm, this is a critique of myself. We get, we get, um, we. It is too seductive to think about gravity in a earthbound sense, right? so that it is a downward pull the way in which we always experience it and that's the way in which i'm using it in my work um, or to defy gravity is to move upward as opposed to thinking about gravity as something that can fundamentally reshape our society our social relations and our relationships to the planet right and so i i guess that where i'm trying to go with this is to think about it allows me to think about black gravity and not necessarily counter because it's not about a dialectical relationship. It is about the restructuring of any kind of force, right? So in a black hole, the force, right, is not necessarily gravitational. The force is, is generative, actually. It is creating something. <laughs>
Um, and so I, I guess that that insight for me, or that, or at least the juxtaposition, um, makes me feel like that will give us the language that you're asking for. Um, uh, that you know that might allow us the possibility of um, of not partaking of the closed system of ecology, right? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll end there because it, it's it's really a speculation. And it's again, it's the same thing as what JT said is like, I'm very provoked by all of these terms and thinking them together. I just want to highlight just for a brief second for folks to throw in, if you have questions or comments in your Q&A, throw them in. Um, Catherine, I think you were about to say something, but I just wanted to do that housekeeping. No, I was just about to say something about falling between the transatlantic rift but <laughs> <laughs> meaning. Um, so nothing very profound, but um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think kind of the up, down, stratal kind of underground, these kind of forms of spatial or kind of, um, I guess the reason that I found them kind of helpful, and I think fire is really helpful in, in this sense, and is, is the, the way in which metaphysics adheres onto an already existing geophysics. So you have you have racial undergrounds and it it kind of provides the already kind of existing geographies for which a language of metaphysics adheres to, right? So rather than actually sort of thinking about these things as kind of metaphysical questions, they're actually geophysical questions about the organization of space and placement mm -hmm. within space and kind of, um, and that's what's fire and the kind of and and taking control of fire in in riots in, is about kind of creating your own space within impossible spaces right so it's about kind of like you know setting fire to stuff is about kind of like making an insurgent geophysics within an uh, impossibility of kind of like you know a, a, a kind of uh, some kind of carceral condition. So um, it seems really productive and kind of uh, to think about this, I mean, that JT is talking about, but also like this, how bodies can move, but also, you know, and material relations can move in different ways uh, to create different kind of worlds and spaces and kind of geographies of being, even if it's just for a moment, right? that actually, you know, and a lot of the performance work that you talk about, Tina, is like, you know, it's within that, but it sets the terms of a new possibility that can create a new geographical imaginary that, like, you know, is something to, to have a sense of a kind of very real geophysics in the world. Mm, mm, mm. There's a question that I'm reading that's really interesting. Um, should I read it out loud to everybody? Sure, yeah, that'd be great. This conversation is fascinating. You're welcome. Thank you <laughs> for your complex thinking. You're welcome. Uh, about the geophysics of anti-Blackness. The geophysical metaphors are powerful, especially the discussion of gravity and the theory of relativity. Relativity. I wonder, though, if you could translate these insights like falling up or curving space into a vision for anti-racist actions, perhaps alongside environmental repair. Um, in other words, what will we actually do on the basis of these insights? Tina, do you see such visions in the artworks you study? Um, who wants to dive in? Um, I, I mean, the, uh, the question for me, um, the, what I, my, my response is um, that the doing is based on the seeing, right? in order to translate something into action, one needs to actually see the possibility for change. Um, and I do see those visions in art and artwork. I do see the ways in which um, artists like Arthur Jaffa or artists like um, Khalil Joseph, um, in particular, um, artists like Simone Lee, Okuyo Pakwasili, Bay, who are all people I write about, um, one of the things that they're doing is they are, their work um, questions the linearity of time in the lives of Black people, right? 
And when you question the linearity of time, you're also um, questioning uh, the ability to occupy space. Um, so I find it really important to be able to see, um, to understand Black people being situated in nonlinear time and using that nonlinearity as a site from which to create um, practices of refusing the um, dispossession of Black people. Um, so yeah, so art to me is, is the inspiration. Art to me is the way in which um, uh, Black artists are bringing together, I was having a conversation with, uh, with somebody yesterday, which is the, the idea of splicing together the different temporalities of Blackness um, and learning from that uh, to be able to imagine something, something otherwise. I think, um, Catherine, your point about um, the riot as a potential reordering of the elemental to towards abolition is a is a, an important um, kind of point. I think alongside black ecologies in in that imperfect naming as not only the kind of emplacement alongside um, or through the violent territorialization of harm and all of the other kinds of effects of ra gender racial capitalism. I think um, you know that that kind of mode alongside um, various kinds of indigenous sovereignties are really the kind of way forward out of. Um, way towards, I guess, environmental repair, if that's the mm. language that we're using. I see as well, um, and I think this dovetails um, uh, from, from a, a comment in the chat um, about the spiritual energy, how spiritual energy might interact with geophysical realities, um, the ones that we're talking about, and also how fire serves not only as an attack against Black folks, but also uh, Black folks have used fire is liberatory. So again, arson, spiritual ceremonies for rebellion, et cetera. Um, I think that is, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I have a chapter in the, this first project, Dark Agora's um, Insurgent Black Social Life and the Politics of Place about the 1964 riot in North Philly. And what's clear is that these black social worlds only show up in, um, in the bird's eye view uh, dominant projection and in the beat patrolman projection that um, that are, are the official cartographies of black life as dead, dying, debilitated, debilitative, um, as future as future risk. Um, and so and which is, of course, the kind of definitional axis of anti blackness and the kind of directionality of its earth politics. But I think when you get to the place where people are burning shit, or, or people are throwing um, glass from the, the rooftops, there's also a whole other social world that's that's announced in that moment. And that are get that becomes evident within the archive, um, through an archive of repression, I should say. But I think, you know, there's another kind of physics there, right? There's another use of gravitational <laughs> forces of anti-Blackness in that moment towards abolition. And I think those are the kinds of um, possibilities that that comment draws up for me, um, both this kind of spiritual melding of the spiritual and the, um, the geophysical for, um, for active disruptions that are towards abolition is, is really on it. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of our time, but I would love to give um, a chance for the, you know, for uh, Tina and Catherine to to say some final words, if you would. I I I don't have any final words. I'm going to give the final word to Catherine. I mean, other than just appreciation for um, the space that you've created for us to think out loud, right? Because it's so often that we have to present something that's really formally finished. But it's it's less um, it's less usual um, or less frequently that we get the opportunity, especially when we're all dispersed and not meeting in person, to just think. Um, so thank you for that, and thank the audience. Thank you for the audience for their responses. Yeah, and just to, I mean to second that, and to and also just say that, you know I think kind of. We've been thinking about kind of well, collectively about these geophysical conditions of kind of decolonization and kind of like the challenge to anti black and gravities. And for me, these are very material. They're not metaphoric. They're, I mean, they get kind of pushed into metaphoric um, 
but the the things that can be resolved in kind of the languages of materiality, the grammars of geology, um, but also in terms of, and I think this is to come back to ASU and the centers and the space that we share in today is really, um, they're also about kind of disciplinary kind of like organizations and interdisciplinary work as actually, I think kind of, you know, I mean, I think that has a liberatory uh, kind of possibility of joining up these conversations, right? Of joining up these conversations between disciplines as a kind of force that actually reshapes the possibility of what is allowed into view and the kind of perspectivism of kind of, you know, of, of earth sciences and kind of environmental humanities and black studies and kind of feminist work. And actually kind of, that's uh, for me, like some of the most kind of radical work is in these rifts in between, you know, what we all do uh, in our disciplinary worlds. Um, so thank you very much for kind of making the space for that. Thank you both so much for this really rich conversation. I'm um, definitely going to be returning to this uh, <laughs> on YouTube to get my uh, my intellectual life on uh, for further further reflection, and I'm sure other many others will as well. Um, thank you so much again to um, the folks here at SST, Jeannie and Marjani, for for making this uh, possible, as well as uh, the folks at IHR and particularly um, Ron for bringing us together in the first place. Um, thanks to our audience. Thank you all so much for your engagement um, and for reflecting community back to us in the, in the chat and the Q&A. Um, we'll end it there. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day, wherever time zone you're in. <laughs>